Okay, so we're going to continue, um, and this time I'll actually I'll, I'll demonstrate exercise 117 and a variety of diagrammatic techniques in uh, Adobe Illustrator, a lot of which obviously I talked about first in the first half of the lecture. Um, but we'll be specific about how do you actually create them. So what I'm asking you to do as part of exercise 117 is to find a building that you can then diagram. And I'm going to ask you to do both a section diagram and a plan diagram, both of which are kind of the most powerful diagrams you can do as part of your, your design process. And so you can pick the same building for both. You can pick different buildings for both. They can be a, a well-documented historical building, or they could be some of your own work, or just something that you think looks interesting online, etc. I'm not going to be grading this based on how accurate you're diagramming. So you could make up a diagram, and it's not a problem. This is about the techniques, not about being accurate. Uh, the one that I'm going to work with is the Kimball Art Museum by Louis Kahn. Um, if Daniel hasn't shown you Louis Kahn's work yet, he will at some point coming forward in 121. Um, and so it, it's something that's coming, so it's not a surprise, and that's part of why I picked it as part of it. So the Kimball Art Museum, I have some pictures that I'm going to flip through just so that you can see. It's a series of connected barrel vaults. It's very well known. It's in Texas. It's very well, well known for the quality of lighting inside the space. It has a lot of natural light, but no direct sunlight. And so there we are with a series of barrel vaults that represent the museum. And here we are in one of the center galleries. And so these barrel vaults have specialized light diffusers at the top, and I'll show you a section view in just a second, and a series of skylights that run down the center of the barrel vault. By having that, we can let light in and bounce that light off of these deflectors onto the ceiling, which then washes down the walls and provides a nice, even ambient light inside the museum itself. So it works very, very nicely. There's another example to provide good quality light for the museum setting as a whole. So if we were thinking about this building in its, in its context of diagramming, we'd want to represent the building based on probably the key idea, like the light. So here we are in the barrel vault. You can see the skylights at the top that let the light in from the outside. So if we look for a section view of the building, something like this, we can see, OK, here's the structure. There's our skylight at the top. There's our little diffusers. And we could use this as part of our diagramming technique. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Adobe Illustrator. And I'll go to File, New. And I'm going to create an 8.5 by 11 page just a letter size page. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Oops, I wanted it to be uh, sideways, so let me go and create another new one. I wanted it to be in landscape orientation. There we are. And now I'm going to bring in, so I'll go to File and Place, and I'm going to bring in that line drawing that I downloaded of the Kimball Art Museum. Oops, wrong OK. There we go. And it looks like I have a slightly different drawing, but we still get the context. And I need to transform this to make it a little bit smaller. So I'll use the free transform tool over here on the left side to make this a little bit smaller so that it fits on my artboard. And we'll go about like that. I'm not overly worried that the bottom half of this is, is going off the page. Let me go ahead and press Control-0 to zoom in a little bit. And now we can see this sectional drawing. So as I start to conceive of this, generally when we distill down the key ideas as part of a, an architectural drawing, we start with a base drawing. And so in this case, this is my base drawing. Let me go ahead and look at my layers. I'm going to rename layer 1 to be base drawing. So I'll double click on it and say base drawing. And the advantage here is I can actually lock the base drawing so that I don't edit it or, or move it going down. So then I'm going to add a new layer, layer 2. And I'm going to call this building. I will leave it selected. And then I need to basically trace over the building a little bit. 
And so you guys have to bear with me while I do this. Oops. I'm going to flip my color so that I have black as my color with no fill. And then I'm going to quickly trace over this building using the pen tool. We'll probably need to do a little bit of extra manipulation there. I'll go back to the direct select. We'll select this halfway point. Do a little bit of a modification there, adjusting the curvature. And we'll call that a day for right now. So I have that piece. I'm going to take that, that piece and do the opposite half here. So I'll take this. I'm going to go to Edit and then Copy, Edit, and then Paste. Or I could press Control v uh, control C and Control V. Then I'm going to, with the new object, I'm going to go to Object, Transform, and then Reflect. And we want to reflect vertically. I'll say OK. There it is. And now I can drag that piece over the top of the building as well. Probably needs a little bit more adjustment. But again, I'm, I'm trying to get these quickly out so that you guys don't have to see me trace over the particular building. So let's take these two pieces. And I will use the Align tool there and there. We'll keep this one in place. And let me go to Window, Align. And I'm going to align them on the top so that they're even. And then this one probably needs to go over a little bit. I'm just using the arrow keys to make an adjustment. So if I were to go back to my layers and turn off the base drawing, we'd see, oh, it's pretty simple. There's my barrel vault. Now I need to draw the little diffuser. So let me turn on my base drawing again, and let's copy this diffuser. I'll start here, create a second point right there, and bend to right there. And this time, I'll go ahead and just do it as a stroke. And let's thicken up that stroke, maybe like that. Quick modification of the center point to more closely match the bottom part of that curve. There we go. Once I have that curve, I'll use the black arrow or the regular selection tool to Control C, Control V to paste. And then I'll go to Object, Transform, Reflect vertically so it goes the opposite way. And then we'll put this one back up. Right there. Probably needs to go over like that. Perfect. So now I have those two pieces. If I were to turn off the background, we'd see there's the diffusers. I probably also need the ground a little bit. So we'll do a quick trace of the ground for the rest of the building. There we go. And we could flip that so that it would be solid. And so now if I tur were to turn off the base drawing, we have a pretty quick sense of what the building is like in a very simplified form. And could I add a little bit more? Could I put the little line in here? Could I put the top of the, the window in? Sure. Now let's start to talk through the diagram itself. So I'm going to create another new layer. And on this layer, we'll call it diagram. There it is. We'll make sure that's the active layer. It's highlighted in blue. And then I'm going to go ahead and start creating a diagram. So the, the simplest form of this diagram would be to do an arrow that represents the sun that would come down, bounce off of here, bounce off of here, and bounce down toward the wall. So I could do that using the pen tool. I could start up high. I could come down to about there. I could bounce. I could bounce, and I could come down toward the wall, maybe like that. I want there to be a stroke color, but not a fill color. And let's go ahead and make that stroke color something other than black. So in this case, going back and finding kind of a nice yellowy, light-ish color, maybe something like that would work. And then I probably need to thicken up my line just a little bit, so we'll, we'll bounce that up. 
you guys can see that okay just something like that so I start with a very simple line that represents the light coming into the space itself maybe I need a little bit more in reality this line and this line are probably parallel so let's take this point and let's move it over just a little bit to help with the accuracy so it looks a little bit better so I have that one and maybe I want to overlay it with another one that comes in a little bit steeper. Something like that. So I have two overlaid lines, and that represents a variety of, of light rays coming into the space. You kind of see how I'm starting to establish that. Now, sometimes you want to take one of these lines, and I'll use the black arrow to do this. I'll select one of the lines, and I want to put an arrow on the end. Now, of course, you could draw an arrow manually. But we also, in the stroke menu over here, by the way, if you, if you get this as your stroke menu, you have to click the little flyout menu and say Show Options. That gives you all the options. And with all the options showing, there's something called arrowheads down here. And I can do an arrowhead at the start or an arrowhead at the end. In this case, I started up high, so the arrowhead would go at the end. So it would be this one. And I can click, and I can see a variety of arrowheads that are available to me. Generally speaking, smaller is, is usually well received. So I'll use arrow 10. And you can see right over here that we have a smaller arrow on the end. I could do the same thing over here, and I could use arrow 10. And now I have a little arrow there. And it starts to show that these are light rays that are repeating. Now, of course, there are plenty of other more corny options available to you. So if we were to sc scroll all the way down, we could use the giant pointing finger, which probably isn't the right choice for an architectural diagram. So just because it's listed here, doesn't mean that you should really use it. The other thing is you could, if you keep scrolling, there are other options like a dot, if you wanted to, to highlight something, um, or a little square, or a little triangle. You could use those, depending on what you were trying to do, to highlight something specific. So in my case, I'm going to go back to arrow 10, and we'll show that as arrow 10. The other thing that sometimes is useful these right now are completely opaque. Sometimes you want to take these lines and make them semi-transparent. I can do that by shifting down here into my transparency window. And I can adjust the opacity you know, maybe to 60%. And now you can see a little bit more character in the way that they overlap. So they're not quite so stark. And if you had a lot of them, this might be a good strategy for for how you kind of show them. And maybe I need one more in here that comes down a little bit more, bounces up a little bit higher, and bounces up against the wall a little bit more like that. So I'm starting to layer these up. Now notice that the one that I just drew is solid, and the two behind it are semi-transparent. Furthermore, the two behind it have arrows, and this one doesn't. We can use another tool that's available in Illustrator that allows us to select a line. So there I have with the black tool selected the line. And I can come down here and there's an eyedropper tool. The eyedropper tool essentially says match some other object. So if I pick the eyedropper and I pick one of these other objects, it will make this line match the, the other objects. So the, the opacity changes and um, the, the line thickness would change, the stroke weight and or the color. So let me go back, just so that you can illustrate this a little bit more. We'll put the opacity back at 100%. We'll make the color awful. Okay, So now I drew that line. I want it to match these other existing lines. I'll select the line, go to the eyedropper, and I'll match those lines. So as long as you have the, the color somewhere else in your drawing, you can, you can match. I do still, however, it doesn't match the arrow on the end, so I need to take my line, come over to my strokes, and add arrow 10 at the end. You can also, if the arrow itself is the wrong size, you can adjust the scale of the arrow. So here I'm at 100%. If I went to 200%, for example, the arrow would be twice as big. 
To me, I almost never in practice change the percentage of the arrow simply because on every arrow then you're adjusting the percentage and you have to go in and do it and it's, it's a little bit tedious. So I don't know that I would encourage changing the percentage, but I like to at least point out that it's available to you as well. So I now have this series of lines that represent the light coming into the building. Sometimes that's desirable, sometimes it's not as desirable. So let me go ahead and show a different option. So I have diagram, I'll create a new layer called diagram two. I'll make that active and then I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the uh, diagram one layer and I'm also gonna lock the building layer so I don't accidentally adjust it. So in this case, instead of doing a line, I'm gonna do a gradient. And so I need to create a shape for that gradient first. So let's go up here and I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna kinda trace over the shape that I have. Like that. And we'll come down. All right, so maybe something like that. And instead of leaving it with the stroke, I'm gonna flip so that I have a fill color. So there's my fill color showing up. And I probably need to make a few adjustments like these points, this needs to come up a little bit more. This point needs to go over a little bit more. There we go, this point needs to go over a little bit more. Easier to make those few adjustments after the fact. If, by the way, you're having trouble getting to a particular spot, sometimes if you um, move the spot away first and then come back to it, it's easier to, to pick a particular point. So there it is. Okay, this clearly kind of represents the light, but maybe it's not the most attractive. Maybe instead I want to have a gradient applied to this. And what I can do is I can select this region, and actually while I'm here, let me go ahead and copy it. Control C, Control V for the copy, and then we go to Object, Transform, Reflect, say OK, and then we can drop this one in right there as well. Maybe I need to make some modifications, but you guys get the idea, certainly. So now let me take this first object. I'll go to my Gradient tool, which is right above the Opacity tool, and I'm going to apply a linear gradient to my shape. And I need to make sure that my fill is selected, sorry. Then we'll go to gradient, and I want to apply a linear gradient. So in this case, it's going from black to white, but it's going from right to left. I don't want it to go from right to left. I want it to go from top to bottom. So I need to adjust the angle to 90, which is going to start at black at the top and go to white at the bottom. So what I can do from black to white is instead of having black, I can use the color that is here. Now it would be helpful if I, since I'm gonna reuse this color, if I created a swatch based on this color. So let me go to my swatches. Let me add a new color swatch. There's that yellow color. We'll say okay. There it is listed so I can go back and use that color again. So let me come back to my gradient. I'll open gradient. And under black here, I'm gonna double click on the gradient slider. I'll go to swatches, and I can pick that gold that I just used. And so now we can see that the gold is going from top to bottom. It's kind of fading out as it goes down. I can do the same thing with this piece using a linear gradient, or I can go to the eyedropper tool and match one to the other. Now notice the orientation is off on this one, so I still have to go back and change the orientation to 90. And there it is. Oops. There we go. And so I've started at solid, and it's going down to transparent. This would look better if it was behind the black, so that the black covered it up. So I'll go back to my layers, and I'll take diagram two and throw it underneath the building, which would allow the building lines to be on top. I could also control, if I wanted more of the yellow to come down a little bit further, I could go to my gradient and I could drag this slider over 
which is going to keep the yellow darker longer before it fades to white. And so I can do the same thing here to there. You could add a third version, a third color, not that this works in this context, where the third color was went back to white, for example, and you can create a gradient that changes from white to black or any other color for that matter. But in that context, I don't, I don't actually want that, so let's get rid of that. There we go. It also might be useful to take these two pieces and adjust their opacity down, maybe to, let's say, 70%. It's just not quite as strong. And we get a sense through the gradient of how the light is spilling out into the space. So it's very different from the first example that I showed where we used the arrows to represent how the light spills into the space. So it's two different ways of essentially showing the same thing. And so you as the designer or the diagrammer need to come up with what the best way is of showing this particular example. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm going to go to File, New, and I'm going to do something in plan form for now so you can see how that would work. So I'll go to File and then Place, and I'm going to bring in the plan of the Kimball Art Museum. Need to make it a little bit bigger. And I really only care about one of the floor plans. So we'll use this one, for example. And once again, under Layers, I will make this base drawing. And I'm also going to lock it so that I can't accidentally do anything to it. And then I'll create a new layer. And we'll call this building. And then, of course, I'd have one more. And this would be diagram to start. And so in this context, it would be a little bit challenging. Unfortunately, the, uh, the floor plan itself isn't that high a quality. If I found a higher quality version, it would be pretty tedious to trace over all of this. So when, when in doubt, if you can avoid tracing it, that's nice. We can always use this background layer, this base drawing layer. If we just change the opacity down so that it's a little bit lighter, it can live kind of as a ghosted image behind your, your drawing. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. So in this context, however, I want to show you how to color code certain regions of a drawing. And to do that, I'm going to use a tool called the Live Paint tool. And in order to live paint uh, regions of this building, I first need to create some lines that represent the building itself. And so while I don't want to trace the building in its entirety, I do need a few lines to, to represent the building. I'm going to create a layer, and I'm going to call that layer Live Paint. If you already have lines that you want to perform a live paint on, duplicate the layer that they're on and call that layer Live Paint. So always have a, a, a separate, whenever you do a live paint, you need to have a separate layer for the live paint. Otherwise, you're going to mess things up long term. So with live paint active, I'm going to draw some lines. And I don't need to be overly concerned with the accuracy of the corners of these lines. I just need them all to overlap each other. So I'll go ahead and this can, I can use the pen tool or I can use the line segment tool. I'm going to use the line segment tool. I'm going to make sure that my lines are black. And I'm going to hold down Shift to draw perfectly horizontal lines. And we're going to create a few lines that go through the building at various pieces. That one needs to go up a little bit. There we go. Another example here. Do one there. And then I need some that go vertical. So we'll go through there, go through there. So I've essentially, I've drawn over the top. And if we were to look at my drawing, there it is. So I just overlap some lines. What I can do with Live Paint is I can select all of the lines. And I can come over to the Live Paint tool, which I believe is under, hidden underneath something. 
It's hidden underneath the Shape Builder tool. It's called the Live Paint Bucket. When I click on Live Paint Bucket, I get this tool. And when I overlap my selected lines, I see Click to Make Live Paint Group. Essentially, when I click, it makes a special group out of the objects that are selected and will then allow me to fill in any of the regions that are contained within this live paint group. So let me turn back on the base drawing for a second so I can see what's happening in various regions. And then let me go ahead and assign a color to a various region. So let's say that I want to code this as the entrance and this as the entrance. And I want to code this section over here as gallery. So we'll change the color. Ideally, I would do some color theory and think about what colors, but I'm picking them arbitrarily right now. And I'd say, OK, there's, those are the gallery spaces. Um, and then I wanted to do some you know, private space. And we'd label the private space as some other color. That's private. This, 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 and this are private for example. And maybe one of them is, is outdoor. So we'll do one more color code. Or something like that. I'm, again, I'm making it up. Once I've created these filled regions, I can then come up here and click on the Expand button, which will actually create objects that I can then use my direct select or white arrow to select. So I should be able to come in, I, yes, and select these as actual pieces here. Yeah. Come on, let me in. Oh, it's just really hard to see. It is actually selecting them. So let me move these onto their own layer. We'll move them up onto the diagram layer. There they are. I can then turn off the live paint layer altogether. And I can work with these diagram objects to adjust the opacity, say, to 50% or even less, 30%, something like that. Well, you guys can't see that as well as I can. How about 50? Yeah, you can see it. And so now my color-coded regions are applying over the top of my floor plan. And I use the live paint tool to create those regions. The other option, of course, would be to just draw the shapes. And so it's just a different strategy of creating it. The more complicated things are, the easier it is to use live paint because you have lots of regions that have weird shapes and, and that sort of thing. So that's how you would color code something. Now let's move on, and I'll show you a few other strategies. So let's say I wanted to show people moving through a space. We'll call this diagram 2. We'll make sure that's active. Now, First thing that I need to do is, with the pen tool, draw how somebody's moving through the space. So I'll start with the pen tool, and I say, OK, somebody's coming in here. Oh, and let me switch so that I'm, I'm filling. And then they're going to walk in here. And they're going to walk around. And they're going to walk into this space. And essentially, I'm just drawing where they're going and how they're inhabiting the various pieces of the space. We go around here. Maybe they went back and looked at something again. And then they got bored, and they went out the way they came in. And then they went off to go get coffee. Okay. So I've envisioned how somebody went through the space. That's one path. Then I'll say, OK, somebody else is going to come in, and they're going to go along a different path. They're going to come in because they got coffee first, and they're going to come through here, and they're going to go down in here, and maybe they're going to have a meeting in this office, and then maybe they're going to come back out, go through here, and they want to come over and see stuff, but they went a little different strategy. You get the idea. And so I'm going to kind of rush through the, the rest of this a little bit. And kind of like the cab spotting exercise, the more of these we create, the more we start to have 
a series of lines that represent how people move through the space. Now maybe these lines become a little bit stark. And so let's, let's go ahead and select the lines. And we're going to change starting, we'll do the color first. And so let's go ahead and do a, a red color this time. And maybe I need the thickness to go up just a little bit so we can see it in contrast. OK, there they are. But maybe I don't want these to be quite so solid. So maybe I'll take one of the lines, and I'll come over here, and I'm going to check the box under the Stroke menu for Dashed Line. Okay, So now it's become a dashed line. It looks a little bit better. But maybe I also want to adjust the dash. Maybe I want it to be a, a finer dash. So we'll say a two-point dash with a two-point gap. And so now it's becoming almost like a dotted line instead of a dashed line. And so if I were to take this and use the um, eyedropper and copy that, I'd start to end up with a series of little dots that represent how people move through the space. This might look a little bit better. The other option would be to use one of the brushes. And so I could take this line. I could come over to my brush tools. And I have basic. And I have a charcoal brush already loaded in. I could apply a charcoal brush. Oh, and let me turn off the dashed line. And we can see it's a little bit more graphic as if I kind of painted it instead. I can load other brushes. If I don't like that one, I can go to the flyout menu here. I can go to open brush library. And we have other things. Under artistic, we could use calligraphy brushes, chalk, charcoal, pencil. I could say, you know what, I want to use a pencil line, something like that. Sorry, I need to select it. There it is. You know, and you could scroll through and say, yeah, one of these is better than the other, and that's what I'm going to use. Those are art brushes for the most part. I could also create my own brush. If I selected the object, these brushes at the top are kind of standard calligraphy brushes. I could come down here to create new brush. And I could choose to create a calligraphy brush. And this is going to tell me you know, how chiseled is the point. What's the angle? Do I want it on a particular angle? And you could create a brush from scratch. A lot of times, picking the presets is easier. And you could just do that. Sometimes, however, you really want to customize what your, your drawing looks like. And you want to create your own brush. And generally, these, these are called scatter brushes. And so I'm going to show you how to do that. So let me come up here. And off on the side, I'm going to draw something that represents a person. And I'll start here with the pen tool. And oops, let me, I'm going to flip so that I have a fill color. And I'm going to draw a footprint. And maybe that was a little pointy at that, at that particular point. So let's convert that to be a little bit smoother there. And then let's go ahead and add a little bit of a heel to this so that maybe we recognize it more as a footprint. All right, something like that. It looks more like a clown footprint, but whatever. You get the idea. OK, so let me take this, and I'm going to copy it. So edit, copy, and then edit, paste. And maybe I need to reverse this. So let me go to transform and then reflect. This time it's going to be a horizontal reflection. There we go. And then I'll take these two pieces and pull them back a little bit so that it represents kind of a footprint. Maybe it needs to skew out just a little bit like that. And this one needs to skew back this way a little bit like that as you customize. So now I have these two footprints. And I'd like to make a continuous line of footprints based on these two footprints that I created. So what I'll do is with the black arrow, I'll select the two footprints. Once I've selected the footprints, I'm going to click and drag them to the brushes window. So I have the brushes window open. I'm going to click and drag these over to the brushes window. See how it turns orange on the outside? I'll go ahead and drop them in. And it's going to ask me, do I want to create a scatter brush, or an art brush, or a pattern brush? You're going to pick scatter brush for this. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And it's going to bring some scatter brush um, icons for myself. So, 
uh, or brush options. So let's call this footprints. And then I have some options. I can choose size. Do I want it to be fixed or variable? In this case, people's feet don't get bigger or smaller, so we're going to keep it fixed. My spacing, do I want it to be fixed or not? I want it to be fixed because their stride isn't going to get shorter and longer. My scatter, again, do I want it to be random or fixed? Fixed is fine. And rotation here, do I want it to be fixed or random? I want it to be fixed, but I don't want the rotation relative to the page. I want it relative to the path. So it's going to follow the path. Then under colorization method, I'm going to pick tints. And essentially, that's going to allow me to change from red to some other color. And then I'll go ahead and say OK. And you see that it now shows up here as those two little red footprints. And what I can do is I can select my curve, and I can click on the footprints. And suddenly, the footprints are going to be where my um, line was. Now, these footprints are obviously way too big. So at that point, I'd have to come back to my stroke weight, and let's drop that down to maybe 0.25. And we get much, much smaller little footprints. When we zoom in, we can see the footprints there as somebody's walking through the space. Now, I could take these same footprints and apply them to this line. So let's take this line, and let's apply those footprints. Oops. Sorry, it didn't like my footprint brush. There we go. And then we need to make that a little bit smaller, so 0.25. There we go. And so as I start to build this up with more and more lines, you can see the footprints and how somebody's passing through the particular space. So you can get creative about what it is. Maybe it's dots. Maybe it's footprints. Maybe it's dog prints. I don't know. It depends on what you're trying to diagram. Maybe it's little tiny arrows. You can do the same strategy. The other thing that people like to do, and I'm going to switch for just a second back to this view, is they like to do something uh, like a bird and use a scatter brush for that. So if I were to draw a bird, give me a second here. That's a horrible bird. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. OK, so let's say I had a little bird like that. I can then take that bird and add it to the brushes again, like this. I can do a scatter brush. I can say OK. And this time, I can have the size set to random. I can have the spacing set to random. I can have the scatter set to ra random. And I can have the rotation random, but I can specify how much rotation is really happening. So I can go maybe negative 10 degrees to 13 degrees. My size, I can go, let's go 70% to 150%. My spacing is at 10% to 100%. My scatter, go up and down a little bit. And my key will be set to tint. And we'll go ahead and say OK. Now that brush will allow me to say that I had a line here. Like that. I have the line. If I apply this to it, you can see that I can get a natural distribution of that bird in various patterns across that particular line. It's a little bit weird to conceive of it when it starts to get the scatter starts to get so big. But it's a pretty cool effect nonetheless. Okay, so it's just a different kind of brush. There are a few other brushes that are available. Um, I'm not going to overly emphasize them. There are tutorials about how to do them on, on the website if you want to. To me, in, in the architectural context, the most useful one is a scatter brush. These charcoal pen and pencil brushes are all art brushes, which essentially allows you to create some shape that gets stretched along the length of a line. 
Um, not necessarily something that's, that's as useful. The ones that are pre-done pre are, are tend to be the, the best in terms of strategy. OK, so what I want you to do today is I want you to diagram over the top of a plan and over the top of a section. It's up to you as to how much of the existing drawing you show. So in this context, the, the footprints matter more. So I'd emphasize those, and I'd probably draw some more pa paths to put the footprints on, leaving those as the dominant feature versus the background. On this, you could choose to simplify it just into the black and the white, or you could choose to leave a little bit of the base drawing behind. In this case, I would probably change the base drawing to be far less stark, maybe something like that. So you have just a little bit of that base drawing behind. And again, it's about what looks right to you. These birds really need to not be um, they need to be like gray or something, because I can't, I can't deal with them as orange. But anyway, you get the idea. Okay? So um, you don't necessarily need to create the bird brush. I'm just showing you that. You, by the way, you can Google Illustrate a bird brush, and there'll be a bird brush that you can use and, and that sort of thing. So, Plan and section, diagram of each. You're going to create one post with both diagrams in it for today's class. Are there any questions? No? OK. I'll turn you loose. <laughs>